I'm Mike Duran. I am a senior fellow and the director of the Center for Peace and Security in the Middle East at the Hudson Institute. Uh, and I'm joined today by Dan Diker. He is the president of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. That's the JCPOA, not to be confused with the JCPOA, which is, uh, which is something that we don't like, but we love the JCPA. And this is a combined Hudson Institute JCPA event, the first of what I hope will be many. And uh, joining me and President Diker is uh, General Yossi Kuperwasser. He was the former uh, a head of the uh, military uh, in uh, the research division of the uh, IDF military intelligence, um, and also the director general of the Ministry for Strategic Affairs. Gentlemen, uh, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to have you here today. We are going to talk about uh, the day after in Gaza, whether a Palestinian state is going to rise up. We're hearing lots of reports reports about the Americans preparing themselves to recognize a Palestinian state. Last week, Pre uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, organized a vote in the Knesset uh, against unilateral recognition of, the Pal of a Palestinian state. Um, but things seem to be moving in that direction. Just uh, uh, we're, We are uh, taping this on uh, Tuesday. Uh, and yesterday, on Monday, we had the Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority uh, resign paving the way for a technocratic government to come into power, a technocratic government that will uh, revitalize, revamp, reform the Palestinian Authority in order, I think, uh, as far as the Americans are concerned, to pave the way for it to play a role in Gaza on the day after. Uh, without um, um, any further ado, let's move, uh, first of all, to you, uh, Dan. Can you uh, give us your sense? You're in Jerusalem, of course. Um, uh, what's your read? on uh on um one what what the americans are up to we heard last week in the debate over this vote about uh condemning a unilateral uh recognition of a palestinian state that uh yair lapid the opposition leader said Ma pitom, who are they, what, what do you mean prime minister netanyahu when you say there are significant elements in the united states that are moving toward recognition of a palestinian state not going to happen i have better relations with them than you do What's your what's your sense, Dan? Is that uh, is he is he right, or is Prime Minister Netanyahu right? And what's the reaction in Jerusalem? Mike, thanks for the question. Thanks for the invitation. It's really it's an honor to be with you and with Hudson, uh, really one of the the real esteemed leadership uh, institutes in in uh, in Washington, and it's it's really terrific to be with you. I, I think we need to listen very carefully to what was an historic vote in Israel's parliament, 99 members of Knesset, out of a Knesset of 120 uh, members, that includes 12 seats uh, that are populated by Arab Israeli members of Knesset, voted to uh, uh, voted against a potent, a possible prospective unilateral US recognition of a Palestinian state. This is a very consequential vote, and it really, uh, suggests uh, that, first of all, Israel today, its body politic, its government, and its parliament, uh, as well as its, um, uh, I, I would say, uh, major media uh, pundits, understand that a Palestinian state, as we have understood that concept over the last 31 years since Oslo, the, the ill-fated Oslo Accords, were signed in both in 1993 and the interim courts in 1995, that possibility of parlaying that into a Palestinian state today would, uh, would forge a, we think, an existential threat uh, to Israel's national security because it was exactly that model that began 31 years ago that through incentivization to terrorism that through the Palestinian Authority leadership's incitement to terrorism, that through the Palestinian Authority leadership's Soviet and Nazi conspiracy theories, media, th their media policies, their international policies of political warfare against Israel, the international policy of isolating Israel through what we call apartheid anti-Semitism, the Nazification of Israel in the international discourse, this played a very substantial role in the pathway towards the October 7th atrocities. 
This is very well known now in the Israeli discourse. And Israel is a country living, continuing to live in an unprecedented trauma by having 134 uh, women, children, elderly, and other innocents uh, kidnapped in Gaza still following, you know, uh, 1,300 people mass murdered in one day uh, by the Iranian-backed Hamas. So the notion, uh, Michael, with this I'll end an opening observation here, of a, of a sovereign Palestinian state anytime in the near or medium future that still lives the incitement still lives with this incentive, official incentivization to terror, incitement to terror, Nazi conspiracy theories about the Jews, a corrupt, a, a massively corrupt leadership has no, uh, absolutely no trust by the, uh, the Palestinian public itself. This is a uh, basically a copy paste of the Hamas de facto sovereign state from which the, the worst mass invasion of Israel took place on October the 7th. This is what the uh, wall-to-wall Israeli society knows could happen again, but it would happen in the hills of the West Bank, Judea, and Samaria, which would uh, which would create an existential threat against uh, the rest of Israel from the hills of of Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. Um, uh, Dan, before I uh, before I go to uh, over to Yossi, um, you say wall-to-wall uh, uh, opposition. Um, are, are there not nuances here? Does when when Lapid uh, when Lapid said that he understands the he has better connections to the Americans than Netanyahu does, and Netanyahu is exaggerating all of this. Of course, Lapid voted for the condemnation as well. But uh, is he speaking for anyone other than himself? Is there is there any uh, uh, differences of opinion here on the Israeli side? That are yes. that, that are that are po- politically and and significant and significant with respect to policy. Yes, there are some there are nuances. Clearly, I think that uh, uh, I think that uh, Minister Gantz, Benny Gantz, who, who is the, the partner with Gidon Saar uh, in the war cabinet, uh, having joined the cabinet uh, following the October 7th um, atrocities, uh, they have a, a, a different view than Netanyahu of of, of a potential um, participation of a completely, I would call it a reconstructed Palestinian authority, because if everyone agrees that there's no way of reforming a Palestinian authority that, and, and you'll hear um, General Cooper in a minute, but he wrote the, he wrote the definitive paper on, on pay for slay that the, uh, the current, uh, Palestinian authority leadership for the last three decades has been promoting. And that is well known uh, by uh, Minister Gantz and, and as well as Yair Lapid, former Prime Minister Lapid, but there is a nuance uh, between uh, let's let's call them the Gantz Lapid school of thought versus the Netanyahu uh, Likud school of thought, and that and and where that divides, Mike, is that they believe that there is some reconstructed version of a Palestinian authority that one can argue does work on some level, certainly in terms of um, defense and uh, uh, security cooperation with the IDF, that has been a uh, that has been a viable relationship. And I think they see the the fact that there has been um, there has been a Palestinian Authority mechanism that on some level has worked uh, that they think can administer, a, a re, you know a Gaza that will undergo international reconstruction um, uh, versus the Netanyahu and the Likud and to the right of Likud position, which is that the PA has absolutely been the problem. It cannot be any part of the solution. Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, General Cooperwasser, what a pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, do you? Why don't I just throw it over to you and see if you have any reactions to what uh, Dan has said, and then I'll follow up with some questions. Well, first of all, it's my pleasure, and uh, I really appreciate uh, your analysis of the situation in the Middle East. Always a pleasure to read it. Uh, regarding the situation here, well, we have to uh, differentiate between uh, three issues that are at stake here. One is a unilateral recognition of Palestinian state. And these 99 uh, members of the Knesset uh, said that they are against it, because this is imposing a situation on Israel without even asking it about uh, what to do. And this is also an impossible issue because, what do you mean? Where is the Palestinian state? The, the situation on the ground is not going to change. 
What, what is the, this is uh, this is uh, hallucinations. <laughs> Anybody speaking about that? Definitely, ninety nine people uh, members of Knesset are against. It. The other question is: uh, Should there be a Palestinian state? And that the the Israelis uh, differ. And uh, on certain conditions, some people say yes, and uh, others have different conditions, and others say under no conditions. And uh, this is a different issue that uh, Israelis have different opinion on. But I think in general, what happened in Israel in uh, since October 7th, and even uh, to some extent even beforehand, but definitely since October 7th, is that the uh, percentage of the people that are against the uh, Palestinian state at this, uh, this situation and uh, only under very extreme uh, conditions has grown considerably. People in Israel, that's why Gantz is, uh, was in, in my mind beforehand uh, not against it, is now against it. And this is why. Uh, so, sorry, uh, just, if I can, sorry to interrupt you, but I, I just want to, um, I just want to identify uh, Gantz for the the viewers who might not be following this as closely as the rest of us. Uh, uh, Benny Gantz is minister without portfolio in the um, in the current government, but he was in the opposition prior to October seventh. He's joined the National Unity Government. Lapid, who said that he had, um, Lapid, who said that he had. Um, uh, a better ear and you know better better read on what the Americans were up to uh, than Netanyahu. He's outside of the government. Uh, Dan just said that Lapid and Gantz are actually working together. But what I'm hearing you say, uh, uh, Yossi, is that uh, is that the American position. Uh, let's assume that the Americans are moving in the direction of recognizing a Palestinian a Palestinian state. This is actually pushing Lapid closer to Netanyahu and far. I'm sorry, pu pushing Gantz inside the government closer to Netanyahu uh, and farther away from Lapid. Am I am I reading that correctly? Yes, because the, on this issue, Lapid is basically in favor of two-state solution. That's, uh, and the Gantz has moved away a little bit from there and uh, is right now against not only a unilateral declaration or recognition of a Palestinian state, but also a Palestinian state under the current conditions. So that's uh, that's where, we, where the politics on this issue of a Palestinian state uh, stands. And the third issue, is what are the conditions for having the Palestinian Authority a role in what's going to happen in Gaza in the day after? And on that, there is a more uh, unclear uh, situation. The, the prime minister and uh, some people around him uh, and the original government of 64 are strictly against giving the Palestinian Authority any role in Gaza in the day after. And this is the plan that the prime minister has presented, and now has presented, it says no, no role for the Palestinian Authority. Uh, Gantz is not as clear on that. He says, let's listen. W what are the better options? Uh, he says, what are the better options? Okay, I'm not uh, gladly inviting the Palestinian Authority to have a role, but uh, let's uh, look at the, the alternatives. And uh, since there are no good alternatives, maybe we should listen to the Americans. And uh, and uh, Lapid is, uh, has not spoken that much about it, but I would say he's even farther from uh, from Gantz. So uh, the Americans are playing here again uh, with raising this uh, bet to the issue of unilateral uh, recognition. They, in my mind, believe that they can have uh, something better when it comes to putting the uh, PA in a position to be, get involved in the day after in Gaza, or even uh, promoting the idea that uh, two-state solution can be acceptable even if it's not going to happen tomorrow with uh, some unilateral uh, recognition of a Palestinian state, that's uh, in my mind the game. Let now, me let me let me uh, if if I could stop you there again. Let me just make sure that I understood what you're uh, what you're saying. You're you're saying that the Americans are raising the the prospect through mainly mainly through leaks to the press rather than uh, public statements. They're raising the possibility of a unilateral American recognition of a Palestinian state. And they are doing this in order to increase the ability, the, the 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 negotiating power of the PA regarding a role in Gaza after the the, the day after the, the 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 fighting ends. Is that what you just said? Yes, that and the, and and about the idea of a two-state solution somewhere in the future. Somewhere in the future, but. But are you are you saying that this is a simply an American negotiating position, or do you think that they will actually do it and carry out the the the? What's the sense in Washington about the intention of the Americans? 
Are they actually moving in the direction of recognizing the Palestinian state? Well, my, I own, don't think my, that, uh, my own view, by the way, is that they are. Well, I, I'd, I'd say the, the following. I'd say that they are totally committed to the idea of a two-state solution. And uh, they know they don't know how much more time they have. We, we all remember what happened when uh, Obama was a uh, lame duck and uh, how he promoted the decisions against Israel in the Security Council uh, back in uh, early 2016 and late 2015. So uh, <laughs> we we remember that very well. And uh, so late 2016 and early 2017. Uh, we remember that very well. So we are worried about the fact that because they are so committed to this idea, they might carry out all kinds of very dangerous steps. Another trick that they are trying to use against us in, this, uh, in the same vein is uh, to leverage the Saudis in this respect, saying, uh, you want to have normal, normal relations with Saudi Arabia, you have to give them the two-state solution or a path that leads uh, in certainty to, to a two-state solution. Yeah, an irreversible so, path to a two-state solution yeah, is the, the language they use. Yeah, so uh, that, that's, the, that's the game. that, uh, And they believe that uh, Israel, because it needs the American uh, assistance for fighting against the Hamas and for uh, handling the other threats that Israel faces in the, in the region, uh, Israel is uh, is now uh, not able to or less able to uh, withstand the, the American pressures. But uh, in my mind, they don't understand Israel. It's, uh, the Israelis are united on certain issues. They are not ready to, to accept this idea of uh, unilateral recognition. They are not ready to stop the war in Gaza. Uh, the Israelis are determined to keep fighting in Gaza until the demise of uh, Hamas and uh, with or without the Americans. And, uh, and the, the, the another thing that the Americans don't understand is that we actually fight for them. It's, uh, we fight for ourselves, of course, first and foremost, but we do it also because we understand this is the interest of the United States to see us winning the war against Hamas and uh, weakening uh, Iran. And also trying to, if, if they, they say repeatedly that uh, they are not going to take steps that are going to endanger the security of Israel, come on. <laughs> moving towards a Palestinian state under these conditions, or even moving towards having uh, allowing the Palestinian Authority a role, having a role in the day after in Gaza is dangerous, it's extremely dangerous to the security of the state of Israel. That is what they have to understand. Extremely dangerous because the Hamas, the Hamas is going to take over Gaza if, if it's run by the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority is so weak and so corrupt that it's, going to not, it's not going to be able to stand in front of Hamas. And the same will go, go to this, if there's going to be a Palestinian state. It's going to fall in the hands of Hamas. If they are going to have elections, we know. You know, the, President Biden just uh, tweeted that uh, we have to remember that the, Palestinian, the, the Hamas does not represent the majority of the Palestinians. Well, come on. <laughs> there, there are some polls uh, that you should read. And so, yeah, even, uh, even, if they don't, uh, even if they don't represent the majority, they still have a monopoly on the use of force in Gaza. And they can compel yeah. the majority. So, uh, unfortunately, they even represent the majority. That's yeah, that, that's true. But they, they do represent the majority, and uh, they are going to win any elections in the future. And this is why there were not no elections in the last eighteen years because everybody knew that the Hamas is going to win the elections. And yeah, uh, we've, all, we've all seen the polling on the West Bank as well about the popularity of Hamas yeah. since October seventeenth, seventh. How it's gone up. Let me uh, let, let me go back to let, one, one thing. Is, that's yeah. why I, I pen together with Maurice Hughes the paper about what needs to happen for how for the Palestinian Authority uh, to be allowed to uh, be considered as revamped, reconstructed, reformed, uh, revitalized. Revitalized. Whatever. Revive uh, the, the how you know what the the administration believes that if you put more adjectives in front of it, it gets stronger and stronger. <laughs> the yes. uh, but you you uh, tell you wrote this paper when and where and with whom? It's in the Times of Israel. It's an op in the Times of Israel. Moise Hirsch and myself uh, with six conditions that has to be have to be uh, accepted by the Palestinian Authority if it wants to have a role in Gaza. And first and foremost, among them. Is condemn the 7th of October uh, massacre. Uh -huh. They haven't condemned it until now. Secondly, stop regarding the, the, terror, the terror organization Hamas as a legitimate member of the Palestinian public uh, uh, domain. It's, a, it's, it's illegitimate. It's a terror organization. Accept it. Stop paying service to terrorists. Fight against, this, against terrorism. Stop the incitement and accept Israel as a Jewish state. All of these things are preconditions that cannot be negotiated before the Palestinian Authority is accepted as a 
as a partner to ruling Gaza. Well, these are some good ideas that we'll uh, that we can advance. But let, let me uh, I'll come back to you in a second on some of this. Uh, but let me go back to to Dan here. Uh, uh, Dan, uh, on Thursday night, last Thursday night, Prime Minister Netanyahu put before the Security Cabinet uh, a list of principles, uh, his principles for putting together a civilian authority in Gaza on the uh, on the day after. I read those principles very carefully. And I thought I perceived a little wiggle room uh, between uh, w the direction of his public statements on this and what he's actually putting uh, for formal uh, guidance to the government, proposing this is a this was a discussion paper that he uh, gave to the security cabinet. It wasn't policy, but policy will probably the policy that comes out will probably be somewhere close to this. Um, and it says in there, if I have it correctly, uh, that uh, that uh, the civilian authority has to have experience in uh, experience in um, administration. It can't be tied to any terror supporting state or entity. Uh, but it doesn't say it can't be tied in some way to the Palestinian Authority. And given the news of the last couple of days with, with regard to the creation of a technocratic government in uh, the Palestinian Authority, I see that as the first step in answer to the American demand, uh, the Abu Mazen, uh, the, the, the leader of the Palestinian Authority, in answer to the American demand that there be a revitalized, revamped, reformed Palestinian Authority. He's going to set up a technocratic uh, government, which will start carrying out some cosmetic uh, reforms. Uh, and then there will be some kind of, I could see a point here where there'll be some kind of um, technocratic Gazan authority, which will have some kind of connection to the Palestinian Authority, may not be directly under it, but some kind of uh, connection, which the Americans will be able to say is a pathway to a two-state solution. And Netanyahu will be able to work with the Americans and stay within his principles at the same time. So I kind of see Netanyahu as threading a needle here. Now, am I wrong? Am I uh, uh, is is there something else going on here? Is that not what he's up to? How do you read what these principles are all about, and how the uh, the the Prime Minister is going to maintain decent relations with the Americans on the one hand and um, also remain legitimate in the eyes of the of the uh, Israeli public, whom as you who as you say have united um, against the idea of a Palestinian Authority taking over in Gaza. Well, Mike, first of all, uh, because you're a dear friend, colleague, and host, you we always say you're never wrong. You can't because you said you, am I wrong? I said no, no, you're not wrong. Oh, feel feel free to, to feel free to attack me uh, uh, violently that's okay we uh, a little <laughs> a little bit of a little bit of disagreement is good is good for uh, is is good for entertainment value if nothing else maybe even intellectual value <laughs> well first mike you asked a very complex question and there are, there are a number of elements components of the question that have to be um, uh, analyzed separately in order to make a coherent uh, observation number 1 the situation in Gaza is so complex. Uh, let's remember, it's very difficult from an Arab point of view, from a from a Gazan point of view, um, to consider any possibility of what they call the day after Hamas until Hamas is defeated. And that's a big statement. Uh, the prime minister also is talking about total victory. He uses that statement in almost every discussion paper, in almost every um, uh, uh, every declaration he makes to the Israeli and the international media. So what does total victory look like? Well, total victory, first of all, looks like uh, a requirement of having to uh, neutralize the final four battalions of the Hamas terror army. And there are still four battalions left in Rafah. And Israel has not yet uh, has not yet undertaken that military operation. And it, it, Israel has, in our understanding, and I and I think I speak for Cooper as well here, every uh, every intention of completing uh, the total victory or the vic the victory military operation 
in order to neutralize uh, Hamas as a terror military force and as a governmental authority. So we still have some path. We still have some work to do there uh, until that is uh, completed, and that involves taking over the Philadelphia corridor, which is that uh, which is that long, uh, really border area that separates sovereign Egypt from the Gaza Strip, and through which there are scores, if not more, uh, hundreds of tunnels that uh, currently are feeding both ammunition and weaponry. Uh, into the Gaza Strip. So that's that's a for, that's a prerequisite before we start discussing any kind of a reform, revamp, revitalized, reconstructed um, uh, a Palestinian anything. The second problem we have is finding any local leadership that is completely disconnected from Hamas because Hamas controls governmentally, you know, 90 percent of 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 all of the uh, uh, of all of the governmental assistance that goes through is, is is controlled by is controlled by Hamas, if not more. So it's going to be very difficult to find local families, local uh, local leadership that is not connected to Hamas that will follow uh, Israel, unless Israel has an overwhelming victory and uses overwhelming power in order to assert that victory. And let's be very clear that the Iranian regime, as well as the Arab states, are watching like hawks to see if Israel has the political will, the possibility and the cap- uh, 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 you know, and the full capability of winning that war in Gaza. That's number that, that's number one. Number two, there are technocratic leaders that are connected to the Palestinian Authority. It doesn't mean that the Palestinian Authority would be the inheritor, per se, as an organization of responsibility for Gaza. But there are elements of the Palestinian Authority who are professionals. Uh, men and women who are economists, who are uh, uh, contractors, uh, who are e- who are experts in public utilities and public administration, who could play a role uh, in a uh, you know in a post Hamas Gaza. But all, but but what the prime minister also said in that discussion paper, Mike, is that the state is that the, the Israeli uh, defense forces and the government of, and, and Israel would have overwhelming uh, would have national security. Uh, uh, responsibility for the Gaza Strip. And what that means in simple terms, frankly, is there going to be for some period in, in, in all likelihood an Israeli military administration uh, in in the Gaza Strip in order to uh, create order and uh, and security, uh, certainly in the first uh, certainly in the first stages. So th- that's number one. And number two, it's very clear that the the United States government is is using this issue of an ir- irreversible path to a Palestinian state it, as a, a precondition to uh, the prospect of normalization between Israel and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. But in in our view, this is much more an American issue pushing the prospective Palestinian state than it has been a KSA precondition. Because if you look very carefully at the statements that Mohammed bin Salman had been using, it was called a pathway to a Palestinian state. They were not making a Palestinian state a precondition. And clearly in the current reality of, of real security, you know, chaos in, in the in the Gaza Strip uh, and their, uh, I would say, deep, deep dissatisfaction with the Palestinian Authority leadership in Judea and Samaria in the uh, areas under in Area A under Palestinian control. They have total lack of trust of the Palestinian leadership. So it's very clear for, for the king of Saudi Arabia that to have normalization with Israel is not going to require a precondition of a full-blown Palestinian state. That's really an American issue. And I believe the Americans, uh, first of all, are, are playing a very dangerous game here because remember, they have to be a, re- a reliable ally. They have to be seen as a reliable ally and they have to be seen as a tough adversary to its enemies. And right now they're being seen as neither. Because as Cooper said, if the the Iranian-backed Hamas or the Iranian octopus and Hamas with one of its main tentacles uh, right now has been uh, very much dictating uh, the pace of hostage negotiations and so on, and from a perception point of view, have been uh, a strong player here, uh, it's going to be, you know, it, it, what the Americans have done here in even, in even announcing an intention in, in an over-the-horizon uh, a possibility of having a Palestinian state is to undermine their own international legal signed um, a, a, a position as being a witness guarantor of the 1993-1995 Oslo Accords. If they unilaterally 
uh, expect uh, or support Palestinian state, they will be completely undermining their own witness guarantor position that they signed in 1995. And it's a that's a very big problem because they're undermining the very Oslo Accords that they signed on to and they hosted. And that sends a very bad signal about the reliability of the United States as a diplomatic partner, certainly to the to the Gulf states uh, and others around the world if they're to to take this type of unilateral action. OK, um, uh, you'll see. Let me come back to you. I want to um, I want to hone in on this question of the Saudis. And I have a question about that. But before I get to it, let me just see if you have any reaction. Is there anything that you want to say to what Dan just said? Yes, I think that uh, back to, to your question about uh, the what the, this plan says about the Palestinian Authority. Uh, we have uh, this uh, habit of uh, adopting constructive ambiguity. Uh, so uh, I think that this is a constructive ambiguity because uh, the Prime Minister doesn't want to say no to the to the Americans. He needs cooperation with the United States, and we are very thankful for the uh, assistance we get from the United States in in the war against Hamas. So it's not the time to say blunt no, uh, but uh, and the same uh, goes with the, his relationship with the, with Gantz and the Eisenkot that are also not totally denying the, the possibility of uh, a role for the PA. Sorry, let me just identify for the viewers that uh, Gadi Eisenkot, uh, like Gantz, also a former IDF chief of staff, um, is uh, together with. Gantz joined the uh, National Unity Government um, and uh, was an opponent of Netanyahu, uh, was an opponent, but after October 7th joined the National Unity Government. And so the two of them are uh, presumed to have a similar view. Well, this, this ambiguity is, is uh, for their sake, but uh, but uh, Netanyahu's real position is very clear. He's against uh, the PA having a role in Gaza and the day after. For him, uh, when he says the uh, that uh, those involved in the governance of uh, governing uh, uh, Gaza in the day after should not have uh, any connection with uh, organizations known to support terrorism. He means Palestinian Authority. They are known to support terrorism because they pay service to terrorists, so they support terrorism. And uh, that's what he means. By, uh, this way, this constructive ambiguity works. Coming back to Saudi Arabia, I think that uh, what happened here is that the Americans, because of their religious belief in uh, the two-state solution forced upon the Saudis uh, this condition. The best interest of the Saudis is not to put this condition forward uh, because what they need is uh, the American, the American, the Israeli support in confronting the real threat they're facing, which is Iran. Iran. And uh, they, uh, they care less about uh, what uh, exact solution will be found to the Palestinian uh, problem. They, they want to see a solution, but they don't. Uh, they are not that married to the two-state solution as the some elements in the Democratic Party in the United States. And uh, let me and, tell you uh, how. A, let me tell you how a friend of mine uh, who is um, very well acquainted with Arab politics. Let's just put it that way. Uh, how he gave me his understanding of the Saudi position these days, and get your reaction to it. Uh, he said to me that, yes, the Americans are the ones who are weaponizing against the Netanyahu government, the Saudi normalization. Um, yes, the Mohammed bin Salman in particular uh, is not particularly interested in the, you know, it, the, the, the two state solution is not something that's high on his agenda or that he's really worried about. Uh, however, the Americans want this. And he doesn't just like Netanyahu doesn't want to say no to the Americans. He's not going to he's not going to bluntly tell the Americans no on this because they're showing such a concern about it. And number two, as the time goes on, uh, his own population is more and more concerned about yes. the, the, the plight of the Palestinians. Uh, and as much as he doesn't have any time for the Palestinian leadership, he's got to listen to his own uh, uh, to his own public. And then on top of everything else, on top of everything else, he's got to worry about managing the Iran threat. Uh, and he can't, uh, which he's not, which managing it, not by working with Israel against uh, uh, against Iran, but by 
showing Iran that it is not going to work uh, uh, to put together a kind of coalition uh, uh, against it, because he can't rely on the Americans to actually defend him against Iranian attacks. Uh, so, uh, so he's adopted a position that allows him to manage all of these uh, concerns, and you can't expect him in this process to come up, you know, to put any kind of serious opposition in the way of the Americans if they are going to go for a unilateral recognition of a Palestinian state and move to try to get the Palestinian Authority involved in Gaza. They're not going to play a big role in trying to help it, but they're not going to do anything to obstruct. How would you, what would you say to that analysis? Uh, first of all, I accept it. I accept all the, all the elements you mentioned. But I think what's happened here is that the, the MBS cannot be less committed to the Palestinian case than the Americans. So once uh, the Americans uh, were pushing so hard uh, to promote the idea of two-state solution or a Palestinian state, uh, he cannot say, "Ah, oh, no, 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 the Americans are pushing too hard. It's, uh, so he has to, to to be there in front of the Americans at least one step ahead. So that's where he's he's got caught. By the way, the, the Saudis, and I wrote about it uh, as well, uh, has uh, had in the past another idea that came from uh, various uh, Saudi sources, including the ambassador to uh, to Washington. They said, okay, we understand it's going to be difficult to have normal relations with Israel because of uh, uh, this idea of uh, con conditioning it on a Palestinian state and the Israelis are not going to accept. But we want to have good relations with Israel, even if they don't move forward on the Palestinian authority the way we want them to. So what we can opt for is a replacement of the idea of normal relations with the idea of integration, and uh, I think integration should, should come back to the to the table. Uh, having practical good relations between Israel and, and Saudi Arabia, without uh, ceremonies and uh, what, what do, signing what, what, all kinds of agreements. So a kind of under the table relationship, like no, uh, no, over the table, over the table relationship that are not uh, over, the, the integration what, was about over the table relationship without having an agreement. What is the uh, what are what are some of the elements uh, the 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 actual tangible elements of integration in this framework? Allow, allowing uh, Israelis to participate in the uh, economic activities in uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, developing trade between uh, between the countries, uh, developing uh, cultural relations between the countries, uh, uh, sports relationships. Uh, all, everything can be done without an agreement. We. we we can move forward without an agreement and uh, get Israel integrated into the Middle East. That was the idea of them of MBS at the time. That was uh, echoed by other. Uh, not everybody in Saudi Arabia accepted. By the way, it's, uh, I think that the Minister of Foreign Affairs is not uh, that uh, fond of uh, of this idea, but uh, but many do, and uh, and uh, I think what should be done by Israel is to bring back this idea of integration uh, of the, the economies of societies. Uh, without an agreement, an agreement can come later. We, if if, the, if everything is right for that, the agreement can come later. The, uh, Dan, my uh, my impression, and correct me here uh, if I'm wrong. My impression that in this whole package that the Americans are putting together, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu finds the normalization with Saudi Arabia um, as a very attractive element, and. Uh, uh, is uh, actually trying to work to find a way to get to it while managing the American um, uh, the American zeal, I would say, for uh, recognizing a, a, a Palestinian state. Is that is that your impression? How in, in Jerusalem are people reading the Prime Minister's views on this uh, uh, Saudi question? Uh, yes, I think uh, uh, Mike, under the current situation, the, the, the look, the Prime Minister, has been the longest serving prime minister in the history of Israel, 18 years altogether, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, quite a feat uh, uh, for Israel. They say, you know, the toughest job in the United States is mayor of New York. This may, prime minister of Israel may be just a little bit tougher than the mayor of New York. Uh, and clearly Netanyahu wants to leave a legacy. Uh, a legacy, one legacy is normalizing relations with Saudi Arabia. The other aspect of his legacy really, I think now is bringing the hostages home and defeating Hamas. Uh, uh, so, so here, if you notice, that the first stop the prime minister made during his last trip to the United States to meet President Biden uh, was California. He, right, he went to California and then Washington to meet with Elon Musk and to spend two days uh, with Elon Musk. And that was a very uh, 
I think, a very shrewd move uh, in terms of signaling, um, it, it, you know, his sense of, of Israeli uh, power, influence and collaboration uh, with the most consequential uh, technology, uh, uh, the wealthiest man in the world, the most uh, consequential technology master uh, on the planet. And, and I think that it's very much reflects um, his uh, total commitment to this tech, I would call it high tech integration with Saudi Arabia uh, that he sees really as a, as a legacy move. So yes, I, I would quite agree with your supposition. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, I, 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 let, I, me, I, let me just add one word here, uh, Michael. Yeah. It's, uh, yes, uh, we want to have, and I want to have a legacy of uh, breaking in, uh, out with the, uh, some progress with the Saudis. First of all, integration is going to be good for him as well. Secondly, he definitely doesn't want to be to have the legacy of the one who caved in in front of the Americans on the idea of the two states in a situation that uh, would put Israel security at risk. So with all due respect to the Saudis, uh, they are not that important. I I I I understand. I um, I just think he is one of the most talented politicians that I have ever seen, and I know that he can't say he can't say Palestinian Authority to his own public, but he can't say no to the Americans, and I feel like he's got a, some idea about how to navigate the course in between. And I'm trying to trying to understand what it is. Um, uh, Dan, I didn't understand one thing. If we could just go back to what you said, uh, you said that um, you connected up Elon Musk to the Saudi question, and uh, and and that connection was lost on me a little bit. Can you just elaborate? Why yeah, is because why, why is a why is a Elon Musk a route to the Saudis or an element in the Saudi equation? Well, well first of all, because uh, because Israel and and uh, Elon Musk is uh, Starlink technology is something that the Saudis are looking at very carefully. And the Saudis want everything. The Saudis love everything about Israeli high tech. And it's and, and it's clear, I mean, I've heard it myself, that uh, that uh, they're uh, deeply interested uh, in our uh, uh, technology, from communications technology to infrastructure technology to cyber technology, you, you name it. Uh, and certainly the Starlink system um, which is a you know one of the the Musk investment portfolios is something that uh, that I think for also perceptually not only from a business and commercial standpoint uh, that the, the Saudis would look very you know very favorably on Israel's relationship certainly the Prime Minister's relationship with Elon Musk who came here following that trip by the way uh, to California so there's this is notion I think there's a whole perceptual issue too Mike it's not just uh, you know it's not just a uh, a concrete uh, financial issue, but a perceptual issue that Israel is the major global tech, you know, high tech power that the Saudis are interested in engaging in a in a whole range of uh, of projects that they're doing now in building the new city in in Saudi Arabia. Um, so I think that Netanyahu really understood that and wanted to underscore that in his last trip to the United States before even going to Biden. I think the first the first her first stop was a was a strong. Uh, uh, was a strong signal to to Mohammed bin Salman himself. But let me let me just uh, finish this point by saying I I very much agree with Yossi that in his legacy he wants to make sure that Israel has defensible borders and he wants to make sure that Israel ha did not give in to what he sees as an existential threat through to, through uh, the establishment of a, what we call a Palestinian terror state. I don't even like the nomenclature of a two state solution. I think it's a the nomenclature is is fundamentally misguided and ill advised because it means uh, that uh, there never was anything called a two state solution until the Oslo until there the final years of the Oslo Accords. That, we, it it came out of nowhere. There, there won't be there won't be two states and and, uh, and it won't be a solution. So no, it's true, but I think there, there's a problem with the syllogism because and I want it's important for the viewers to, to see this. Because if you call it a two-state solution, and Israel Israel has no a priori right to exist if there's no two-state solution, because it means there's no if there's no Palestinian part of the solution, it means there's no solution. And if there's no solution, as the argument goes, there's no real reason for Israel to exist a priori if there's no solution. Um, so I think it's a it's a real problem, uh, uh, also from a uh, from a perception point of view, and also from a logic point of view. Uh, you know, the, the fact is. That the Palestinians have done, the Palestinian leadership has done everything in its power to prove that it is an unworthy partner uh, on, uh, you know, to be the 193rd state of the UN system and to be 
uh, a worthy partner uh, to Israel because they've done everything, as Yossi has said, uh, uh, to prove themselves incapable of uh, providing a, a security as a neighbor to Israel. And, and rather, they've done everything to advance Israel's insecurity and threats to Israel's fundamental security as a mini state in this uh, in this cauldron of uh, of Islamic extremism across the Middle East. OK, let, let me I think we have time for one more round of, of, of questions here. And let me uh, let me pose to you, uh, Yossi, if I may, a kind of hypothetical. Um, uh, as I read it, um, I, I think uh, I could be wrong. I could definitely be wrong. But I think the Biden administration um, is uh, hell bent on recognizing a Palestinian state um, and uh, hell bent may be uh, too strong of a. Uh, description, but I think they really want to do it. And I think they want to do it for domestic political reasons, if for no other reason. Uh, and they, they want to say to their progressive base, yes, we supported Israel in this war against Hamas, but we got a Palestinian state. And they want to go to the elections on this. And so I expect that we'll see a recognition in, in, in early, uh, in the early summer. Now, uh, I I agree with everything that you guys are saying. I think it's it makes no sense as a sound national security strategy, whether for Israel or for the United States. It's counterproductive in a, a number of different ways. But let's just assume that the administration really does go down that path. What kind of steps can Israel take and should we be advocating to minimize the damage that this will do? Well, I think that... Uh... First of all, I, I, as I said, it's a real threat and a real danger that we have to face. Uh, even though I don't think, it's, uh, I'm not sure that uh, the, the probability that I would give to that is as high as you do, but uh, there is a probability that we cannot ignore. And uh, the uh, thing we have to do is to work hard through all kinds of people that can speak with the government in the United States to explain to them how dangerous this thing is. And how dangerous it is, not only for our, our own security that they care about, I hope, and I think, uh, but also for the security of the United States, because this means that you empower the enemies of the West. You empower uh, Hamas, because they are, they are going to take over. And you empower Iran. You empower Hezbollah. Uh, what, what is the logic behind doing all of that? It's, uh, it makes no sense for the security of the United States. The, the lesson learned would be that uh, attacks like the uh, 7th of October pay off. And uh, let's uh, carry more of them, and uh, not only against Israelis, but uh, against the supporters as well. We saw it uh, with the attacks against the Americans throughout the Middle East, following this uh, the seventh of October, and we shall see it uh, not only here, but uh, beyond the, the Middle East. So it's uh, we have to explain to to the Americans that this is a wrong move, and uh, I don't think they do it just because of uh, political uh, reasons. I mean, political reasons may have an impact on, on that. But uh, they do it because they are real believers in the importance of having a Palestinian state. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, I, maybe maybe uh, you're right. I mean, maybe instead of saying just domestic political reasons, it's an ideology. I mean, they are they yeah. are picking they are picking up where Obama left off, as you mentioned, with the UN Security Council res resolution. I think it was two three three four. Correct. And uh, and. Uh, uh, and the Kerry parameters, John Kerry had his parameters that this is where they're they're starting again uh, as if, uh, you know, we are we're 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 now uh, we're now seven or eight years later. But they're picking up again from that point uh, as if since then we have learned since then that this is the wrong attitude, that there is a problem with the Palestinian narrative. First of all, deal with the Palestinian narrative. And then you can move towards uh, all kinds of ideas of solving the, the conflict. But if you don't deal with the Palestinian narrative, you actually play into the hands of people who want Israel to disappear. What, what is the logic behind that? Well, uh, Dan, you want to close us out here? Give your final thoughts. What, uh, uh, if you have an answer to my question, that's fine. If you have something you want to add also about the danger of this uh, step, that's that'd be great. I think, first of all, uh, uh, Mike, very much so that, it, that we need to be in front of Congress uh, on this issue, because this is an existential issue. The the, the Obama administration uh, misread the Middle East, uh, thinking that the that the key to security, stability and prosperity of the Middle East is first a Palestinian state 
and that will bring order into the greater Middle East when the truth is, and I think that you would subscribe to this also, is that the truth is that it's completely opposite, that the Iranian octopus and its tentacles, uh, whether in, in Lebanon with Hezbollah, whether it's Syria, whether it's the Houthis in Yemen, whether it's the whether it's the Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad and others in Gaza, whether it's the Iraqi special, the Iranian-backed Iraqi special forces, uh, Qatayb Hezbollah in, uh, in Iraq, and, and in others, uh, you know, subverting almost every single state in the Middle East. That is the source of subversion and lack of uh, security, stability, and prosperity in the Middle East. And as Cooper said very well, if be, by, by essentially uh, a calling for uh, their uh, unilateral uh, uh, endorsement of a Palestinian state, they are actually strengthening the Iranian regime, weakening American st uh, strategic uh, interests in the region, and and placing Israel at tremendous risk. So what can be done is a there's an international legal problem here that that it, it's the destruction of Oslo that America signed on to. Number two, that we can talk to, we should be talking to Congress, both houses, explaining the existential danger. I believe it, it really depends who wins the election, but I think that if Biden does not win the election, I think there's a there's a fair assessment that an incoming president, whoever it would be, would overturn uh, the way the former administration uh, overturned 2334, uh, moved the American embassy to Jerusalem, recognized Israel's, uh, uh, Israeli law on the Golan Heights, um, uh, and also determined, uh, the State Department determined that from a legal point of view, uh, uh, Israeli settlement and housing building is not, is not illegal, uh, which, uh, which I, I understand now the, the, the current State Department, the State Department has recently uh, apparently overturned uh, that uh, policy. So policies can shift and policies can change, but I want to uh, just uh, uh, really agree with both you guys that this is a fundamentally dangerous move for U.S. A vital interest in the Middle East by recognizing a Palestinian state is basically injecting the Iranian regime and all of its uh, its power, its ammunition, its malign its malign influence, and its uh, and its intention to destroy Israel, as well as not understanding. That the uh, that the Palestinian narrative ha is has been very similar to the Hamas narrative, the destruction of Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people. Hamas and the PA are essentially aligned on their ultimate narrative, on their goals and narratives. Even though Hamas does it through perhaps Islamic uh, narrative, a purely Islamic narrative, while the the PLO PA Fatah has done it through a combination of Islamic uh, imagery, Islamic declarations, as well as national, you know, as, as sort of national arguments. Okay, well, uh, gentlemen, uh, thank you for your insights and your wisdom. We really appreciate it. And I hope that this is, as I said, uh, the first of many collaborations between the Hudson Institute and the JCPA. Uh, without uh, any further ado then, I'll say goodbye. <laughs>